This he conference will now be choice. recorded. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so good morning, everybody, and welcome. And once again, good morning to those who are here in person. Good. And let us start Parshat Truma, page 444. Okay, so we have just finished. We had Matan Torah, we had by Mount Sinai, where of course we did not receive the Torah in its entirety as we hold that Torah. Of course, those stories were written during the 40 years. The Torah was written, dictated to God, to Moshe by God during the 40 years that we were in the desert. But we had all of the mitzvot as we saw in Parshat Mishpatim. And now we have the commands about building the Mishkan. Okay, building the Mishkan. Mishkan is translated as sanctuary, right? Another term that's used is the Mikdash. Actually, we use both of those terms. <clears throat> right, we say over here, if you look on page 444, right, the very bottom verse, Pasuk Chet, Va'asuli mikdash, make for me a mikdash, v'shachanti b'tocham, and I will dwell, I will rest in your, in, 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 amongst you. K'chol ha'shim matzavayotcha, amarotcha v'et tanita mishkan, all that I'm showing you, we turn the page of 446, the form of the mishkan. So typically, we use the term mishkan for the tabernacle before it was established in its permanent place by King by Shlomo Melech, King Solomon in Jerusalem. And then it became the Beit HaMikdash. Then it became the Mikdash. But actually both terms are used somewhat interchangeably. So let's understand these words because actually Rav Hirsch points out that these words are coming from the different directions. Mikdash, the root of the word Mikdash is what, my friends? What's the root of the word Mikdash? Kadosh, holiness. Kodesh, holiness. And the root of the word Mishkan, Shin Chaf Nun, Shachain, Shochain, Shechina, right, is to rest upon, to dwell. My Shachain is my neighbor, that they are dwelling over there next door to me. So Mishkan is dwelling and Mikdash is sanctified. So what is these different angles? Who does what? Or when we, when A does B, then C does D. <laughs> Fill in the blanks. Sanctify, God dwells. Exactly. Right? When the people sanctify, then God dwells. Okay? So when we make it into a place that is Kodesh, that is holy, so then Hashem's presence dwells there. If not, then Hashem leaves. Right? And we have... Uh, well, we know there was a destruction of the first temple, the second temple. The Mishkan was in Shiloh for hundreds of years, and it was destroyed. <clears throat> but it's never, it's only been destroyed, not that there was anything wrong in the physical structure, but it was only destroyed when we were not treating it with the proper Kedusha. We were not making it a Mikdash. Then it no longer served as the Mishkan. Hashem, right? the, the nations can never destroy a house of God. What they could destroy was a house of wood, gold, silver. Once the divine presence, once the Shekhinah had left it, then they can destroy that. That's simple. Tragic, but simple. Actually, the term that the sages use is Kimcha. What's the term? I, I, the, he was eluding me. Gr they ground up ground flour. 
Al Kimcha Tachun Tachan. Good morning, Ora. How are you? Right? That it was ground flour that was ground up. Meaning, once it had lost the presence of Hashem, it was already ground flour. Then they could come in and grind it up, so to speak, and destroy it. So let's come back over here again. And Ora had asked, so let me just have a quick introduction over here once again. Cheryl, good. Gabriella, Lauren, or Ariel, you prefer Ariella? Okay. And Esther. Okay. Ora, that was for you. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. You're very <laughs> I, I feel okay. included now. Good. Okay. So let's, um, let's begin. 444. Had it to be my bar mitzvah parsha this week, parsha truma. I actually called my cousin was the one who taught me my bar mitzvah parsha, and I called him this week. I said every year before I lane, I think I have to I have to thank you. So I gave him a call this week to thank him. It's been a few years since my bar mitzvah, but uh, but I but I've used his, his his training fairly well over the years. So I wanted to give him a shout out. Does okay. That mean you're going to be reading it for? I'm not, well, I'm reading it during the week. But Shabbos, it's it's the Bader Bar Mitzvah this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Amitai, the youngest Bader child's Bar Mitzvah is this week. So he'll be doing the reading, and I I happily bow to that and let him <laughs> let him take over. By the Bereshit emotionally, Moshe spoke to Moshe, saying, "Daber el bnei Yisrael, speak to the children of Israel, v'yikuli turuma, me'et kol ish asher yidveno libo." Tikhu et trumati. Speak to Bnei Yisrael, the Yichuli Truma, and let them take for me Truma. Truma is a portion, is a donation. Me'et kol isha she yidvenu libo, tikhu et trumati. From any person, asher yidvenu libo, that his heart will motivate him. Tikhu et terumati. You shall take this truma. So famously, we've mentioned before, but it's so important. It would seemingly, it should say, v'yitnu li truma. They should give to me a donation. Right? I don't knock on someone's door and say, hi, I'm here you know, for the shul. We have a great project. I'd like to. Uh, I'd like you to take a donation. Actually, we'd like you to give a donation. What's v'yichuli truma when it should be v'yitnuli truma? You shall give to me a truma. Why v'yichuli truma? already belongs to Hashem. I mean, it's not really theirs. I mean, okay, good. I'm going to take from what's already mine. Okay. So Esther said very beautifully on one level, everything belongs to Hashem. Everything is Hashem's, right? Now, we, uh, when I spoke on, on Shabbos, I mentioned the idea of, uh, of giving. Uh, I have to mute you. I'm sorry. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting a little bounce back. Mm-hmm. Nothing personal. Okay. So on Shabbos, I mentioned the idea of ma'aser, of giving, giving of tithing, giving one-tenth of our earnings to tzedakah. Right? And the Gemara says, aser kadeshitit asher, right? Tithe in order that you will become wealthy. And the idea of the ma'aser, ma'aser is may eser, right? From 10, right? The idea is, and the Kliyakr, or the Archaim discusses this, why is it that Hashem gave this person more than he needs? Right? This person needs, this person has too much, right? You know, did Hashem, you know, heaven forbid, get it wrong when he decided to distribute how he distributed? No, for whatever reason, this person needs to go through the humbling situation of receiving from others. And this person, for whatever reason, was given extra. Right? We mentioned this last week, etani imach. That which belongs to the poor person, that's by you. So Hashem gave you part of his portion, and you are meant to have a discretionary account that you can decide which 
causes, which individuals, which institutions, which cause, whatever it is, you should do it, but it's not yours. This is taking it a step further, like Esther is saying. Everything belongs to Hashem. Everything belongs to Hashem. So when we're giving something for Kedusha, for holiness, what are we in effect doing? We are returning it to from where it came. Good. Yes, Esther. Yeah, we're recording. I didn't tell you being your best behavior. That's why you're not sure. Okay. Yes, Aura. Um, in my well, I I, I accept that uh, everything is, belongs to God. Uh, another way to look at it, I think, is that um, it no has a feeling of. Um, choice or it's it's a softer kind of approach and Yikho is very aggressive and more like an order so i i think that uh the point here is that it's a it's an order to to give not a choice okay okay so this is a little more forceful they have to realize that this is, but then it says, Asher Yidvenu Libo, right? Only one whose heart offers it, right? So it would seem to me that maybe this is more like, this is more a way of getting us to understand, of getting us to a point of Yidvenu Libo, getting us to the point where our heart wants to give it. Jenny, did you want to say something? No, I, mis I misread the cue. Yes, Esther. Interesting that um, the order is to give before Hashem says what it's for. It's not until later, further down, where he says it's for a sanctuary. It's like, give to me whatever my portion is. Just, you know, it's like if you go to somebody's door and you say, hey, I need money. What do you need it for? I just need it. That's interesting. That's an interesting idea. Instead of I'm raising funds for this or that, you know. That's interesting. And that, and that, that's interesting. And that I think speaks to what you said before, right? And everybody heard, estimate an interesting point. It's only, we're only told when we get down to Pasuk Chet, the verse eight, what this is for. Right, Rabbi. Rabbi. Yes. Isn't this the whole point of Judaism to do as we are told and not to ask questions or look for the logic? Um. Hmm. Uh, we, 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 we let's break that down. It, it, it is the point of Naaseh and Nishma. Right, we had that before. Naaseh and Nishma were the famous words that we said by Mount Sinai. Naaseh, we'll do it. The Nishma, and then we'll hear what it is. Right, tell us what. Right, tell us what to do. Right, I'm in. I always say, you know, your, your spouse says, you know, honey, can you? Right, the answer is yes. Now finish your sentence. Yes. Right, because we know that our spouse is not going to ask of us anything that's that, that's unreasonable. So therefore, yes, and our trust is in Hashem. But I wouldn't phrase it the way you did, or not to ask questions. We're meant to ask questions. We're meant to understand and to try to get as deep and full an understanding as we can. But we don't limit our doing to our understanding. That's very important. It's not if it makes sense to me, I'll do it. If it doesn't make sense to me, I won't do it. I will do it because I believe that this is a mitzvah, a commandment from Hashem. But being this is a commandment of God, there must be so much depth and understanding and resonance and power to it. So I will plumb the depths to the best that I can to gain as much in the understanding of it but I won't limit my performance to my understanding. Even if I don't fully understand, and that's what we've mentioned many times, we have that whole category of mitzvot called chukim. A chok is a mitzvah where God specifically did not share with us 
the reason. Why? Because he wants us to understand, like I like to say, that we can't fit all of God's wisdom into our four square inches of gray matter. And to think that I can understand everything, that means God's only as smart as me. And, it, and, and if when it doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to do it, it means God is only as smart as me. So if I don't understand it, it doesn't make sense. So why should I do it? And as I always say, I don't want to serve a God who's as smart as Sinner. That's not very impressive, right? So yes, yes, we do even when we don't understand fully because we, we know we can never understand fully. But at the same time, we want to grab and understand and ingest, internalize as much as we possibly can. Gabriella. Mentioned in the past, that's a, that's essentially a bodhisattva. Like when you limit God to, or when you imagine that God is as far as you can imagine. That is correct, correct. And the way Rabbi Sachs explains it, eh, yeah, share, eh, yeah. What the way when God, when Moshe said to Hashem, I'll go to the children of Israel, I'll tell them that God appeared to me, and they'll say, What is your name? Well, what should I say? And God said, eh, Yeah, share, eh, yeah, and many, many, many uh, comments have been written on that. But Rabbi Sachs says, at its, at its core, it's, I will be that which I will be, meaning you are not going to be able to predict me. You're not going to be able to say, Oh, for sure, God's going to do this. Right, because you think you know, but you don't know, and we have to accept that. But at the same time, we study and study and study as much as we can to try to gain as much as we can. Good. Rabbi? Another idea of Yichli Truma is that a person realizes. I told you the story of of what's a great philanthropist in Canada, Mr. Reichman. Right. I told you a story about Mr. Reichman socks. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody knows the story of Mr. Reichman socks. That was very briefly those who weren't here. So when he died, he left instructions for his children. He wants to. He was an incredible philanthropist. Right. Gave out millions upon millions upon millions and millions of dollars. And when he died, he left in his will. He wants to be buried in his socks. And his children approached the Hebra Kadisha, the burial society. And they said, listen, it's very important to us, our father's wishes, right? And they said, listen, sorry, sorry, no dice, right? No socks, right? Meaning everyone, the Gemara says, when the Gamaliel established that everyone gets buried in the same exact burial shrouds. It's very, very mefubad. It's just simple white garments that completely cover every part of the body, the face, the hands, the feet, everything, everything, everything. And everyone gets buried with the same exact, it's called tachrichin, the shrouds. Everyone the same. And they said, absolutely not. The, the, the children tried, argued, this, that, this, that. We'll give them that. We're not budge on it, right? After the burial, there was another letter that the father had, had left for them to open up after the funeral. And the letter he said, by now, I'm sure you've seen, that I couldn't even take my socks with me. And that was his instructions to his children to make sure to continue with his philanthropic ways and not think because you can't even take your socks with you, right? You can't take it with you. The Yichuli Truma, there is one thing that you do take with you. What do you take with you? Whatever you've given away. Isn't that paradoxical? What you keep, you don't have. What you give away is yours, is your zechut, it's your merit, it's your mitzvah for all eternity. And we mentioned earlier, a couple of weeks ago, by Bishalach, that Moshe took Atzmot Yosef, Emo. Moshe was busy. He was kind of busy by the Exodus, but he was the one who he himself took care of the bones of Yosef. He took the bones of Yosef Emo with him, meaning that became his for all eternity. Any of the other bizatayam, as we call it, the spoils from the sea of the Egyptian chariots and horses and soldiers that everyone else was collecting, that you don't take with you. But the Asmod Yosef, he took with him. So the Pesach is letting us know, V'yikhuli truma, 
take truma. What you're giving is actually what you are taking. That becomes yours forever. I've shared before the story. There was a great rabbi in New York in the 1920s, 30s, Rav Yaakov Yosef Herman. And he was a fully Torah observant person. And this is in New York when that was not what was widespread at all. It was only really after World War II or during World during the 1930s and 40s when there were an influx of many observant Jews. But before that, he was kind of standing alone over there to a certain degree in New York. And he was very, very wealthy. He was a furrier. And he would give tremendous amounts to tzedakah. And then the late 1920s, the Depression, he saw things were falling apart really, really quickly. So what did he do when people came to him for tzedakah? We would think when people came to him, he would say, listen, I'm sorry. I used to be able to help uh, right, in a very significant way, but things are really, really tight now, and I don't know what the future holds. Right? I'm sorry. I can't help at all. I can only give a small amount. What was his reaction? He started giving more and more and more and more. Why? Because he said, look, clearly I'm losing this. So let me save it. All this is going. So let me hold on to as much as I can. How do I hold on to it? By giving it away. Now it's mine forever. If I wait another day, the stock market is going to drop another 500 points of that much less to give. So let me give it today. And that way, it is mine. The yikuli truma. Take for me truma. When you are giving a donation, that is something that you are taking. That becomes yours forever. And this is something, well, I, I'm not of the great fundraisers. I know I don't really enjoy it very much. But I was helped by a certain understanding. And that is, if I were to knock on someone's door and I'd say to them, listen, I've got the best investment that you could imagine. Right? Let's say it was a, a monetary investment. I got an investment that's going to pay dividends for the rest of your life and the life of your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Would I feel a little bashful about knocking on the door and presenting this to someone? Of course not, because they're making good money on this investment. So with tzedakah, the investment is far better than any investment I could, anyone could ever offer. It's yours, you keep the principal, you get the payrolls, you get the fruits, you get the interest. It's yours for eternity. Well, you give away, you know, in, in an investment, if you invest something and you get your principal back and then you're still getting dividends on that. Oh, that's the, that's the, you know, that, that, that's the, that's the holy grail of investments. Wow. You, you, you cash out completely. And you're still getting dividends on on what? On air, on fumes. You got back your initial investment, but you're still making money on that. That's the holy grail of investments. That's what we're offering, right? And, and, and when a person who's collecting for tzedakah, for whatever it might be, an institution or an individual, whatever it might be, that's what we're offering that person. The yichuli truma. You're taking, you're gaining. This is the, this is the deal of a lifetime. Yes, Jenny. So uh, what Aura was talking about, that we we do it, even if we don't understand it, we're supposed to do it. So when it says, whose heart motivates him, that's the, that's the free choice aspect of this. Of this. So that makes it, uh, yeah, so it's a be better investment if it's a free choice than saying every person has to give this amount of money. Yes. Yes, yes, 100%, right? There's what we do, and there is how we do it, right? And uh, that can make, and that makes a tremendous, tremendous difference in the value of, in the way, as we understand, uh, not presumptuous enough to say as, but as we understand, the heavens weighs each of the mitzvah. There's a famous story 
that I wrote in one of my art in the 1990s. I was writing Parsha articles. It's on Torah.org still, right? And um, and I told a story, and they still send it out. And just a couple weeks ago, I got a letter from somebody. Rabbi Sina, why did you use this story? Don't you know that? So I don't know how legitimate necessarily the story is, but the concept is a concept that we believe in very strongly. And the story that's told, though this person took me to task for it saying, that's not true. There's been so many variations of the story. Who it actually happened with? Two women, let me just say. The story that I heard was one with the wife of the Vil Nagon and, an, and, and her friend. But two women, this is the story whether it's exactly accurate, who, what, where, but this is what we understand is the truth. That they were walking along and they were they would collect tzedakah for needy situations, needy causes. And they went to the home of a certain wealthy person. They knocked on the door, there was no answer. And then they're walking away. And then they see his carriage pulling up. And they both said, there he is. But one of them said, there he is, pointing. The other one said, there he is, without pointing. And they made up that when they would leave this world, whoever would go to the next world first would come back and report to the first one what awaits them for all of their tzedakah. And one of them passed away first, came back to the other one and said, you should know that because of raising the hand and saying there he is as opposed to just there he is, that excitement about the mitzvah we were able to do now to help this family we were collecting for for that, it's it's inscribed in a completely different book, so to speak, right? It's a whole different thing. So certainly, certainly, Jenny, when we do it with our yeah. heart, when we do it with love, with with the vacus, with the connection, that completely brings it up to a whole different level. And that's how it is with all the mitzvah that we do. Right? And we know we're the same way. If someone helps us grudgingly, so our our attitude is... Thanks, but no thanks. You know, I'd rather do it myself than have, you know, something with our kids, right? I'd rather do it myself and have this long face, right? Look, looking at this long face that you have to help me, right? But, um, you know, Rabbi. when someone does it, does it happily, so then that, that completely elevates. And this is important, you know, whenever we're doing something, to try to add that little bit to it. I remember years and years ago, I was a teenager in Israel. And going around in, in Geula Meish Aram on Friday, doing some shopping. And a lot of people are there collecting money. So what do you do? You give everyone a couple of, a couple of shekel. That's what you give each person. I mean, there's one person that I just learned this halacha, that, 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 that is how you do it more than just doing it. So when I saw him, I said, how are you? I didn't see you last week. I, and I spoke to him as if he was a, as, right, treated him like a human being, not just a person with his hand out. Right. And you should see the change in this person's face. It's, I still remember it to this day, the change in this person's face, because I took out 10 seconds from my life and made him feel important, made him feel missed. Not like, oh, this guy's coming to me for money again. But, oh, where were you last week? Are you feeling well? How are you doing? How's the wife? How's the kids? Whatever it is. So certainly what you're saying, Jenny, I share you venuli bo that we do with this nedivut halev, with this offering of the heart, that is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Yes. Rabbi? Yes. Rabbi? So, but doesn't that go, even Rambam determines that, you know, on the ladder of Sadaka that um, we should, even if our heart isn't um, at that stage yet, we should still give, because as you said, before, you know, giving... A hundred percent. Janet, a hundred percent. I'm not saying give with the whole heart or don't give at all. I'm saying do, and then we need to work on doing it in a better way. What I said was that the way we feel, if someone's going to help us and they're going to be complaining, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, our attitude is, you know what? Don't do it. Thanks anyhow, right? I'm not saying Hashem has the attitude. I'm saying we have that attitude. So certainly we need to do, and then we need to work on ourselves to try to do it with, with energy, with his lavos, with this uh, fire, right, of, the, of this great, great opportunity, this great gift that we have. That's how we need to and, try to look at it. And then to your point about the, um, the dividends, um, after the full payout, 
we have that in morning prayers where it says these are the mitzvot for which um, we get credit in this world, but also remain in Correct. the world to come, right? In, in Birchas HaShachar. That's right. So, that is right. So it, it's let's... cited right there. Yep. Excellent, Janet. Thank you. And let's see, we'll see the same idea over here in a moment. Let's read on a little bit. V'zot ha And this is the donation. Asher. Now, it's so, also so interesting. Truma. Right? What is the root of the word truma? Resh mem is the shoresh. What is ram? Taram, right, to lift up. Right? So it's a truma. On one hand, I'm lifting it up from what I have and giving it. But actually, we ourselves become this truma. We ourselves become uplifted when we when we are giving from that which is ours, giving that to others, when we're doing for others, that is how we become Ram Venisa, Gadol Venora. That's how we become lifted up and and how we transcend who and what we are and we become a different, a better version of ourselves. But let's look now at the at the order of donations zahav and this is the truma shetikumaitam zahav gold kesef silver nuchoshet uh brass they copper techelet the argaman techelet is wool that's dyed blue argaman purple tolad shani that is red the sheish the izim linen and wool the orot elim adamim and some hides from these different animals, vatse shitim, and wood, this 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 type of wood, acacia wood, shemen lemaor, oil for illumination, besamim l'shemen hamishcha, and also for the for the anointing oil and l'ktarta samim, and for the incense, avne shoham vavne miluim. Avne Shoam, the Shoam stones, and the Avne Miluim, La Efor the, the breastplate of the Kohen he wore had 12 gems inside of it, and also the Ephod, the, the apron that he wore, had these two apron like garment that he wore, had these two settings on the shoulders for two stones, and then 12 stones across gems across the breastplate. What's a little bit strange about the order over here? Look at the order. Look at the value. What's a bit strange over here? You would think that the stones would be higher up on the list. Right? Gabriella pointed out the stones, we would seem, should be higher up on the list. We're starting, we seem to be working down in value. We seem to be working down in value, gold, silver, copper, working our way down. And then all of a sudden we have diamonds, rubies, pearls, sapphire, you name it. You have these incredible gems that the, the Talmud tells us, the Gemara tells us a story that there was, the, the Gemara Kedushin learns out honoring parents from a Gentile, from Duma ben Natina. And the Gemara that tells a famous story that he, the Chacham needed to replace one of the gems, and he had that gem, and they went to him, and they wanted to pay, a fantastic, whatever he would ask, they would pay. But it was in a box, and his father was asleep. And to get it from that box, the father was sleeping on his legs or on it, whatever it might be, it would wake up the father, and he said, no, I can't wake up my father. And they went on elsewhere and bought it elsewhere. And next year, the Gemara says, a para aduma, the red heifer, which is very, very rare, which is used for the service in the temple, that was born to his flock. And they came to him and he said to them, I know if I ask you any amount in the world you'll give to me, I'm only going to ask you that which I lost out by the, by the gemstones. That's how valuable these stones were. And the Gemara says, if that Gentile honored his parents so, how much more so must we learn to properly honor our parents? 
So as Gabriela pointed out, this order is seems to be very, very, very off. We started gold, silver, and the very, the, the very last thing we're mentioning are these incredible gems. Yes, Cheryl. I'm thinking that the gold and the silver and all of these other items are for the Mishkan, but as valuable as the gems and stones are, they're for a person, even though that person is doing a holy okay. Uh, Okay, Job. so they, they were not going into the construction of the Mishkan itself, Cheryl, you're saying, but they went into the garments of the Kohen, yeah. right? Of the Kohen Gadol, right? That's an interesting idea. There were others that also went into the garments, right? That Chela Agaman was also used, well, that was used for both. That's very interesting. One is used, right? And even, they could take it a step further, that these are used only for one person, only the Kohen Gadol, right? right? Though though we do say that he is acting on behalf of the entire nation, right? That's an interesting idea. That's an interesting answer. I never heard that before, uh, Cheryl. That's a very nice idea, that one is for the Mishkan, for God, so to speak. Right. The other is for this person who will be serving God in this way, right. But it is one step removed. Very nice. Very nice. The Medrash tells us a story. The Medrash tells us that, well, we know later on, Parsha Naso, by the consecration of the Mishkan, the Nisim, the leaders, each brought a gift. Right? Why were they say why were they so eager to bring a gift? Well, over here they dropped the ball. The measure says that well a, a couple of explanations. One is that when Moshe came for them for the, the, the for the donations, they said what would be a fundraiser's dream. They said, "Listen, collect from other people also. Whatever you're missing, come back." Right, imagine a fundraiser comes. How much do you need to raise? I need to raise $5 million. Okay, go around the neighborhood. Let me know how much you raise, and I'll fill in to the $5 million. Wow, music to our ears, right? However, there was something lacking, meaning they should have had this energy, this zeal, this excitement to, yes, let me, let me participate. Because if I'm doing that, I'm running the risk that if the five million is raised, then guess what? Thanks, but no thanks. You have no chaylek, you have no portion in this. So this was given on the back end. And therefore, what was it lacking from Pasuk Bet? Enthusiasm. The enthusiasm, the, the yidvenu libo, the, the motivated heart. And therefore, in Hashem's eyes, where was it brought down to? The bottom. Bottom. One other thing on this. Fascinating. Avne Shoham. Too bad Linda's not here, right? Avne Shoham. Linda Shoham. Right? Avne Shoham. The Avne Miluim. And filling stones. Setting stones. What is Avne Miluim? Rashi says, Al Shem Shaosim Lahem Bezahav Moshav. In the gold you make a setting, a uh, a crevice or right, a, a, an open area, and then Kiminguma, the Nosana Evan Sham, and the stone goes there, Lamalo Tagumuma, to fill up that hole. They're called Avne Miluim. That's why they are called Avne Miluim. Fill stones, setting stones. Now, right? Imagine you got this beautiful diamond, right? And then you want to go get a ring, right? It needs to have, so it comes, it has a setting where it's going to set, right? The ikar, the main thing is the ring, right? It's not, oh, I need a stone to fill the setting. 
Oh, I need a stone. Oh, I've got a ring here that has these prongs, but there's nothing there. There's a hole in the middle. I need a stone. Oh, so I'm going to take a diamond, and that will be my filling stone, my setting stone. No. So why are we calling these gems Avne Miluim? Filling stones, stones that will fill this area. They are precious gems in and of themselves. Why Avne Miluim? What do you say, Rabbi? my friend? Yes. Rabbi, because um, individually, each would light up to fill the holes in the uh, or, uh, in the questions of B'nai Yisrael through the Kohen. You know, they would collectively light up to give an answer to questions. So that was a gap. Something was not known or, for, or okay, needed interesting. interpretation. So Jana, or... Okay, so Janet wants to say that actually we find throughout the Navi that was, was called the Urim Vitumim, which was a fold with God's ineffable name written that was in the fold where underneath where these stones sat. And this was a way of divine communication, that they would ask a question to the Kohen, to the Kohen Gadol, and the different letters of, on these stones was written the names of each of the tribes, and different letters would light up, and that way they would get this divine message, should we go to battle, should we not go to battle? Actually, when Hannah uh, was praying for her child, who ended up being Shmuel and Avi. So it says that Ailey, the Kohen Gadol, thought that she was drunk because the letters lit up, Shin, Kaf, Resh, Hey. But it doesn't write up in order. He saw those four letters and he read it, Shikura. Actually, what was it meant to read? Ke, Ra. She is kosher. She is holy. She is pure, right? So, Janet, you want to say... That, but it wasn't really the stones. It was the so Janet wants to say that the, there'd be these little holes that this this one would open up that one. But that wasn't really the stones necessarily. That was letters on the stones that some would light up and others wouldn't. So I heard a, a beautiful shot from Rabbi Shlomo Price of blessed memory, who was uh, one of my rabbis when I was post high school, and I ended up being a, a, a colleague of his. Uh, teaching together with him for many, many, many years. And he was an amazing person. He he had a lot of physical, physical um, challenges, health challenges, physical challenges. It was hard for him to walk. and But he always had an amazing, amazing smile on his face. And I remember one time I, I gave him a ride and I, I, I was driving up the hill. I had a car. He didn't have a car. I was driving up the hill. So I let, he comes to the car and I said, how are you doing, Rabbi Price? And he goes, oh, I thought myself, oh, boy, if he's saying, oh, then it must really not be good because he's a person who, no matter what happens, was always, always just um, always, always with a smile. He said as follows, Avne Miluim, as precious as the gems are, the value of something is measured in what it does for others. The value of something, the value of a person, the value of something is what does it do for others? As fabulously expensive as these gems were, Avne Miluim, there's a hole that needs to be filled. They are called fill stones. That is the ultimate value of what something is. Avne Miluim, these fill stones. I, I, I just heard part of something which was fantastic from Rabbi David Foreman last night. I was listening to some of his some of his teachings. AlephBeta.org. In case you haven't heard me say that a thousand times, let me say it again. Aleph Beta. I don't get any commission. I, I get a commission. Right? If you're inspired because I sent you there, that's my commission. That's my vehicle truma. But um, I don't get any commission. I actually pay. I donate when I can to uh, because it's it's such wonderful teachings. Take a look over here. 
he says something. It's it's so David Foreman like. It's it's just a fantastic. When we're making the Aron, Pasuk Yudal, page 446, making the Ark. We give the dimensions. Vitsipito to Zahav Tahor. And it'll be covered with pure gold. Mibayit umichutz titzapenu. Inside and outside, it should be covered. So Rashi explains you had a wooden box. Into that went a gold box. And then the wooden box would go into a bigger gold box. So you had three boxes, right? Like the kids' toys almost. You have the boxes that try to figure out, right, to stack them properly. So there was gold, there was wood, there was gold. Inside and outside, it should be covered. Okay? And then what went on top of that? On top of that went the kaporet. What was the kaporet? The kaporet was that golden plate from which the kruvim, the angels, were all carved out. That sat on top. So he asked, where else do we find wood in the middle and another material inside and out? Where else do we find that? To fill in? No, I don't think it is over there. The ark? Ark, right? Noah's ark was wood. And what was inside and outside? And actually, there was this pitch inside and outside, right? Take a look on page 30 in Bereshit Perik Vav Pasuk Yud Dalid. There it says, Vaselcha Tevat Atse Gophar, make an ark of Atse Gophar, of Gophar wood. Kinin Tase et Teva with different compartments. The Kaparto Tummi Bayetumi Chutz, Bakofar. And it should be covered inside and outside with pitch. That's the only two places in the Torah and all of Tanakh where we have mi bayit umichutz, right? Inside and outside. And he points out v'chaf parta in that pasuk. Chaf pei resh taf can mean you shall cover it. But those very same letters spell what we have by the Amr. What do we have by the Aron? Ka po ret. Same letters, same order. So he, and he brings many other parallels also of a connection between so he points out see here we've got wood on the inside and we've got gold on the outside which is lustrous there we've got pitch which is black gold reflects the light pitch absorbs the right right so we have this beautiful wood with inside outside over here by the aron and we have this wood with inside outside pitch tar by the teva by the ark. Yes, Cheryl. Um, I always envision those boxes to be like lined with gold, so that you didn't see the wood. It was like. So actually, so Rashi says the way that they lined it, it wasn't like it, it got you know sprayed on. It was three separate boxes. The only place that you would see the wood would be on the top, right? Kind of like plywood. You see the different, right? The different slats that make it, right? But then that was all covered, right? That was all covered. But Rashi explains the way it was made was with these three different boxes, that that's how it was constructed. So he goes on to say something very, very interesting. He says, the flood brought the world back to how was the world described during the time of creation the spirit of god was hovering over the waters so it was like a water world the pre-creation world was like a water world at a certain point so what's happening god is bringing this world back to a pre-creation state and creating a place for mankind to live what was mankind noah and his family and over here we are in this mankind world and with the mishkan what are we creating a place for god to live 
And the center point of that place for God in the Mishkan was the Aron, was the Ark. Because that is where, when Hashem, when Moshe would hear Hashem speaking, he was in the Mishkan, he would hear God's voice emanating from Mibain HaKruvim, from the area between those two Kruvim. So we have a world which we, through our sins, had kind of sent it backward, and therefore God needed to create a place for us, which was this wood covered with this dark material, dark, malodorous material. And then when we have, when mankind is going where we're supposed to be going, then we are creating a place for God in this world. And that is radiant that is illuminating that is the wood the idea of the wood and the gold is wood we didn't want it to be most other things were straight gold the aron the ark was wooden had wood in it why because net oil an explanation that's given gold right these minerals are as they are period wood is growth is alive and has the capacity to grow. Torah is called Eitz Chaim He. It is a tree of Chaim, of life. And therefore the Aron needed to be this, need to have this growth component of it, the wood. At the same time, there needs to be gold on the inside, on the outside, and that they explained to me in the concept that the inside needs, right, we need to, uh, a to those who are presenting Torah need to present in a proper, dignified manner. That's the gold on the outside, but there also needs to be gold on the inside. The expression is tocho kibro. The inside needs to be like the outside. It can't be this hypocritical inconsistency in that person. So that's what we are doing over here. With this mishkan, we are creating this makom, this place for God in this world. The Medrash says it so beautifully. We'll end with this, that Hashem said, I've given you the Torah. The, the Medrash compares it to a person who gives away his daughter in marriage and says, but I love her so much. Please make a little room that when I come visit, I'll have a place that I can stay and visit with my daughter. Hashem says, I've given you the Torah, right? Make a place that, for me that I could come and stay. And that is the Mishkan that is the Arun, that is us creating a place in our world for God, but it's got to be Mikdash. And only then can it be Mishkan. We've got to make sure that it is Kadosh, it is sanctified, and then Hashem's presence can rest down and join us over here. Okay, my friends, I'm away next week in Florida at a rabbinic conference, but... um. And then the week after that is Purim. So I think we will resume in three weeks time. Yeah, Purim will, yeah, we'll resume three weeks time. Please God. Okay, wonderful having everybody with us. Thank you. Goodbye over there. Okay, Bye. good. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi? Yes. Rabbi, uh, I haven't yes. heard anything about Purim. Are they going to make any announcements about They're, when we're going to... Emails are going out. Do you get the, the BGI Weekly email? Yeah, I do. Yes. So please, please read it. All the okay. information is in there. All the All information right. is in there. Thank okay. you. And Mishloach Manot, everything you, is there. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi, and Shavuot Tov, everyone. Very welcome. Shavuot Tov, Shavuot Tov, everybody. Bye-bye.